Uh, good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, I'm Andrea Montanino, the director of the Atlantic Council Global Business and Economics Program. A special welcome to European Commissioner Cecilia Malmström and her team, who I'm sure have had a very busy days and last days in Europe last week. I'm delighted that all of you have joined us today for a stock taking of TTIP uh, after Brexit. The next round of negotiation has just been announced a couple of hours ago, will take place in Brussels in two weeks. And Commissioner Malmström is the first European leader coming to Washington after the, the British referendum. We are all eager to better understand what the next steps are for TTIP and for the EU after the vote. But we do not only seek to understand, but also we at the Council advocate for a stronger Europe. Since the European Union, I want to remi remind to all of you, is one of the richest areas on Earth, has strong institutions, both at national level and European level, shares among its participants the same values of liberty and democracy, and plays a key role in global economic governance, among many other things. On April 18, 1951, less than six years after the fall of Berlin and the end of the war in Europe, Germany and France, alongside with other four nations, Italy, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, created the European Coal and Steel Community, which paved the way for the founding of the European Union. Thanks to the foresight of men as Robert Schuman, Altiero Spinelli, and Jean Monnet, and the strong political and economic support by the United States, something that was impossible to think about a few years before was able to become reality. So things that seemed impossible just last week can become reality now. We think it is time to face the challenges Europe has ahead and transform them into opportunities with the ultimate aim of creating more prosperity for European citizens and the whole world. And this is why we launched the Euro Growth Initiative last March. Through our publications and events like this, we want to galvanize this transatlantic community to contribute its ideas. I want to thank Jose Manuel Barroso and Stuart Eisenstadt for having accepted to lead this effort, as well as the whole task force, the Eurogrowth task force. I'm particularly happy that some members of the task force are here today. Ambassador Boyden Gray, Anders Aslund, Tony Wayne, Laura Lane from UPS, and Stefano Itri from Beretta. I also invite all of you to bring home our first three publications, two on TTIP and the third one about the United Kingdom's economic gains from joining the European Union in 1973. The publication are out, but outside, uh, and you can grab it. So the outcome of last week's referendum only reinforced the importance of the transatlantic relationship and our mission, the Eurogrowth Initiative mission. I cannot think of a better person to open this discussion than European Trade Commissioner Cecilia Malmström, who has been steering the European Commission's work on trade since 2014. After her remarks, Ms. Malmström will later be joined on stage by, let me say, a fantastic panel, Ms. Laura Lane, President of Global Public Affairs at UPS, and Mr. Trumka, President of the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organization, AFL-CIO. The panel will be moderated by Joe Schatz, editor of the Politico Pro Europe Brief, who has been one of the leading transatlantic journalists on TTIP trade and Brexit. After the moderated panel, we'll open the discussion to the audience. For those who follow uh, along with via Twitter, uh, and please tweet about today, I invite you to use the hashtags Yes to TTIP with the number two, and EU growth, which is our hashtag for the Euro Growth Initiative. It's a positive hashtag. We talk about growth and not about crisis. So, Commissioner, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased and feel privileged to be here today. Uh, as I said before, we decided to create a little drama uh, before coming here, so this uh, referendum was organized. I, uh, and I'll come back to that. Um, 
in Washington only for a couple of days, unfortunately, so I can't stay for your 4th of July celebrations. That's a pity. Uh, everybody likes a good celebration and with fireworks. Um, some people seem to think also that trade negotiation is like fireworks, but I have to tell you they are a little bit more boring. National holidays, those are an important time together with your family and friends. In my country, Sweden, we have just celebrated Midsummer, which is an uh, old pagan festivity uh, where we pay tribute to uh, fertility and uh, summer and life. But this year, when we woke up on Friday morning, well, some of us had spent time in front of BBC, it was a little bit, bit less festive than usually. It became clear early Thursday uh, early Friday morning that the UK and its citizens had decided to vote to leave the European Union. Of course, we respect that vote, but I must say that we regret it. It will have big consequences for the UK and for the EU as well. I know you all have a lot of questions uh, about this. I will try to answer some of them, but we also need to realize that we need a little bit more time before we can fully grasp the consequences of this uh, referendum. There was a meeting yesterday with the heads of states of the European Union, including Prime Minister Cameron, and today also the other 27 um, uh, heads of states and prime ministers met to discuss the future. Uh, formally, the, European, uh, the UK are still a member of the European Union, the referendum, even if it was you know, very clear, does not legally change anything. In order for us to start the exit negotiations with the United Kingdom, the Prime Minister has to trigger what we call Article 50 in our treaties. And uh, Prime Minister Cameron has said that he will leave that to the next Prime Minister, probably to be chosen uh, in September. So before that, nothing can really uh, start. And the formal exit negotiations, which are highly technical and, and includes a lot of practical uh, items, will, be, will take some time. And they will go on, uh, and m lots of these issues have to be solved before we can even start thinking about the relationship between the European Union and uh, the United Kingdom. This is, of course, something that the, the no camp, the next uh, prime minister, will have to define how would the UK like to, to see their relation with the, uh, the European Union. It is not really for us to define that they have chosen to leave. Uh, of course, they are a neighbour, a friend and an ally. We, we have a lot in common, but out is out. They can't be half, half in. But exactly how that will materialise is a little bit uh, too early to say. So for the moment, they are in. And uh, when it comes to, to, to TTIP, that means that... Uh, I, I, I and my team, we are negotiating on behalf of 28 countries. And that could very well be the case for another year or two or even longer. So I had the possibility yesterday to meet with Ambassador Froman uh, and we, we jointly agreed, and this is also backed by, by 28 countries, that the rationale for doing TTIP is as strong today as it was on Thursday, maybe even stronger. Uh, the reasons why we chose to embark on this uh, is they're still there and we will continue to, um, to, to talk, to negotiate and we had the possibility yesterday to go through a lot of different items and to prepare for the next round of negotiations that will take place in Brussels starting the 11th of July. We are committed to this trade agenda, we are negotiating with a lot of other countries as well, not only TTIP, and we will do whatever we can to make sure that we make as much progress as possible the coming month, if possible, conclude it before the end of the Obama administration. Um, that is still the, the plan A, and that has not changed even if, um, if, if the referendum uh, is there. And as I said, the Brits are still with us and we are negotiating them. And that was confirmed yesterday by, by member states. Now, um, and I'm sure we'll have possibilities to discuss this in the Q&A and in the panel. Back to national celebrations and holidays. Uh, because they are related to trade, because they are an expression of how people assert their identity. And identity has not always been part of trade negotiations, but they are very much today. And that's a little bit of the paradox we are facing. Because global trade and investment has never been more important for our economies. But political debates on trade and investment has also never been more intense. 
that is true here in your debate in the upcoming presidential you have a presidential election, no? I thought some, yeah, I read that somewhere. Um, and also in our countries where, where uh, trade and TTIP is being, being debated. Here, I think the focus is mainly on NAFTA and on TPP. In our countries, or at least some of our countries, TTIP is very much uh, debated as well. That is a good thing. Uh, and the debate focused very much on how to reconcile preserving our identity and our individuality embodied in, in Midsummer and the 4th of July celebration, and among many other things, but also the way how we choose to regulate our societies, our economies, when we live in a globalized world. And our response to that so far has been twofold. First, of course, that we need to engage much more with people to address the concerns. That includes changing the approaches on how we negotiate trade. We need highly ambitious trade uh, agreements also that effectively create economic opportunities. So we need to listen, engage, and we need to show that the economic opportunities are there. And in TTIP we can do both, changing the approach and highlighting the economic rational. And we have already taken important steps to engage in the debate and modify our approach. For instance, in response to public concerns in Europe, the European Union has shown an unprecedented amount of transparency. We have published texts, proposals, background reports, detailed summaries of the negotiations online for everybody to see. We are traveling around, uh, together with my team and, and, and Mia, we are traveling around the European Union to engage in different citizens' dialogue, to reach out, to listen, and to, to answer questions, and also take concerns on board with us into the negotiations. Together with Ambassador Froman, we have made clear that removing regulatory protection is not an aim of these negotiations. We have also made clear that we want a system to protect investment that is secure, but regulates the freedom, uh, guarantees the freedom to regulate. And we have been united behind the principle that TTIP should not change government's ability to provide health care or education or water or all of the above. We have agreed that TTIP must be a way to protect our values around the world, particularly when it comes to uh, labor and the environment. And if we want these negotiations to succeed, we will have to continue to adopt and to continue the dialogue with stakeholders. So that is one response to popular concern. But also, if we want people to support this deal, we have to create real economic opportunities. We have been negotiating this now for three years. We have come a long way. We can uh, begin to see the outlines of what TTIP actually will look like. But we still have a lot of work to do. And to meet our target of the end of the year, we need to work a lot more. And we are ready from the European Union to do that. We are preparing ourselves to have text ready across the board by the summer break. Uh, we are prepared to make the political choices needed to close this deal by the end of the year if we have the right results. We will not conclude a TTIP light just to have it concluded. It has to be a good agreement that the US can get through its political system and that we can have the acceptance uh, in our 28 member states. So what does this mean? this mean? Well, starting with market access, trading goods, we need an ambitious outcome that removes the remaining uh, tariffs on almost all areas. Here we are relatively well positioned, ambitious offers on the table from both sides. On trading services, we have more to do. First, TTIP must address the long-standing existing barriers, particularly from our perspective, that uh, the EU service providers face here in the US. That includes addressing restrictive approaches to issues like maritime services, aviation services, telecom, and the cross-border movement of service providers. <clears throat> it also includes mutual recognition of qualification for professionals, like, for instance, architects, and a strengthen cooperation so that we can effectively regulate the transatlantic financial service industry. Second, we also must secure existing openness to international competition. Much, interna uh, much international services trade uh, depends on investment, and thereby predictability is, of course, very important. So what is clear is that the EU has the larger effort to do uh, when it comes to guaranteeing existing openness, while the US has the larger effort to make in terms of addressing existing trade barriers. So we are working on both sides to address these uh, issues. 
A third element of uh, market access is public procurement. This is um, necessary, it's a sine qua non to have an ambitious agreement here uh, and creating new opportunities at the federal and state level. We are looking from the EU side to establish a level playing field. When EU companies compete for contracts with the federal government and in a critical mass of US state, we want to have the same advantages and possibilities as US firms have under our, our European system. We have one set of rules, we have full transparency, a joint database that announces all public procurement possible contracts at all levels of the European Union. So here we are seeking uh, a more uh, level playing field. I am very aware that this is a sensitive issue in the US. We are ready to explore an ambitious outcome that takes these sensitivities into account. But this is a highly prioritized area from the European Union side. So a substantial improvement here is needed on market access opportunities at all levels of government. The second pillar that regulatory cooperation is vital. It must be ambitious if TTIP is to deliver growth and jobs, but also carefully implemented if we are to address public concerns. Uh, and that means we need to do three things. We need to agree on common principles for good regulatory practices on both sides. That means, for instance, committing to high quality impact assessments, public consultations. It means addressing technical uh, issues such as standards and conformity assessments. Secondly, we must provide a platform to help our regulators to cooperate in the future. There would be plenty of work to make the transatlantic regulation more compatible after TTIP is finished. A built-in agenda for a future regulatory cooperation is therefore essential. So it is its institutional framework that fully involves regulators from both sides. We have, in the EU and in the US, the best regulators in the world. If they can work together to share knowledge, data, expertise, to advise our lawmakers, we can jointly set very high global standards. Of course, this should also be in the mutual interest and not restrict uh, either side's freedom to regulate in the public interest. So this is an advisory uh, body. Um, and, and ultimately, it is the, the legislators who make the decisions, of course. The third goal of regulatory cooperation is specific results that reduces unnecessary duplications of requirements. We are discussing on both sides the respective rules for nine sectors, such as pharmaceutical, engineering, medical devices, uh, motor vehicles, textiles. Now it's the time to turn this into commitments. We are ma making proposals here for the July round, for instance, on medicines, and we will uh, come with more in the coming weeks. And here we need a good outcome for the economic perspective and also the credibility. And this is possible. Uh, we are not here to limit the freedom of US agencies to regulate as appropriate under their statutes. We're simply seeking technical fixes to bureaucratic hurdles and deeper cooperation in future. And here we have already made good, uh, good um, progress. The final pillar of TTIP is what we call global rules that covers sustainable development, small and medium-sized companies, geographical indications, and investment. Sustainable development. Here we are from the EU side aiming for provisions that protect labor rights and the environment in both our jurisdictions to strengthen our cooperation on these issues also around the world. We want TTIP to have the most ambitious provisions ever on labor rights and on the environment in our trade agreement. Our trade and sustainable development chapter, that you can all read, it's online, uh, makes reference to the ILO declarations from 98 and 2008. It addresses the issues such as a decent work agenda, health and safety uh, at, uh, at, the, at labor. And we also want to promote these standards globally and uh, to promote globally also the work against child labor, to protect endangered species, promote corporate social responsibility, etc. And we're also now starting the discussion on how this should be enforced. Second, rules to ensure small and medium-sized firms, SMEs, so that they can benefit from the deal, because it is more cumbersome for them uh, to, to handle all the, the bureaucratic obstacles, to fill in all in the forms, to, to keep track of all the different tariff lines and so on. They don't have the economic possibilities to have whole departments to do that, such, such as big companies have. And for them, trade barriers are significant and they cost a lot. They, they don't have this army of lawyers and, and experts. 
But what, one thing they really need is to, once we have an agreement, to easily access the information on the rules that they have to follow. And that's why we want in TTIP to have a commitment uh, on both sides to some sort of online stop, uh, one-stop shop for all the relevant information on accessing each other's market. Third, geographical indication. This is uh, also something that is very important for many of the EU member states. Geographical indications operate in many countries around the world, not only in the EU, and they are like all forms of intellectual, intellectual property. They reassure consumers, they compensate to producer for their quality and know-how, and they are difficult uh, to enforce when products are uh, exported around the world. And that's why, like patents or copyright and trademarks, geographical indications need to be protected in trade agreements. And this is feasible. We have had strong uh, provisions on geographical indication with uh, countries such as Canada and Singapore and Vietnam. Both are countries with the outer history of this kind of protection. Of course, the US is different, and we have had long uh, debates on, on this issue, and uh, we are, of course, ready to find a reasonable approach, meaning that the vast majority of the indications we want to see protected do not conflict with existing US standards. And for the small number that does, we have to find pragmatic results, willing to do this, of course, within the framework of the US legal system. This is difficult. Uh, we had a long discussion yesterday, but I, I want to repeat, this is really important for our constituency as home, uh, at home. We need a high quality result here. And the final issue here on rules is investment protection. This is a very sensitive part uh, of the negotiations. It's particularly sensitive in many of our member states in the European Union but I think it's a global uh, debate. We, of course, share the view that investment protection is vital to promote growth and jobs by supporting the deepening of global value chains. And investment, foreign investment is always more vulnerable than domestic investment, so there can be uh, cases when it needs extra protection. But we also need to address the people's legitimate concerns. And um, that is why we have uh, embarked in the European Union to try to reform that system, much more, more transparent, much more, more uh, focused in order to avoid abuse and to make sure that uh, we can respect democratic choices to regulate in the public interest. This is a new uh, investment court system that we have proposed, that we have in our agreements with Vietnam and Canada and that we are right now discussing with the US. So getting a deal like this will not be easy to do this before the end of the um, President Obama's administration. It will require both sides to do its utmost, uh, to do not only what we have done in traditional trade agreements, but to, uh, to go further. We will need to adopt, but I think it is possible. Because if we make this adoption, um, it is worthwhile, and we do have today the political support to do it. Uh, we have tough debates in the European Union, we have resistance, we have demonstrations, absolutely, but we have unanimous mandate from all 28 countries, and that commitment remains. And in the US, I know that there is a very intense debate on trade as well, but we have uh, a strong support in the administration and from members of the Congress on both sides of the aisle. And even in these trying times for trade in this country, uh, I have noticed that the focus is not on TTIP, but mainly on, on TPP. And I think people understand that TTIP and TPP are different issues. Uh, they are different parties. Uh, the European Union is, uh, is, like the US, a highly developed economy. It's the world's largest market. We have high, some of the world's highest regulatory standards. Uh, and the, the competition due to lower labor standards is not an issue with the, with the EU. And we have strong protections for all kinds of intellectual property, including biologics. And when people come to look at TTIP in, in more detail, I hope that the support will be there for the concessions needed. And also, I think it is possible because we, do, we know each other. We understand each other's politics. We know the constituencies that need to be on board for the outcome, whether they are farmers, key business sectors, trade unions, or consumers. We know our requests need to be reasonable. We know we have to respect and to respond to each side's reasonable requests. And what we are looking uh, for on procurement, on services, on regulatory cooperation, investment, geographical indication, that is doable if there is enough political will. 
We have, of course, like the US, our red lines, but we fully understand the objectives that the Congress have set for this administration as well through the Trade Promotion Authority. We can't do it alone. We will need to work closely together, the EU and the US as well, and with our different constituencies. And I look forward uh, to continue to, to, to do that because TTIP is worth the effort. It's a positive response to the concerns on globalization that are shaking uh, our political systems on both sides of the Atlantic. It's a way to strengthen our friendship, our alliance, and our partnership. P in TTIP stands for partnership. We share so many values, so much history in a difficult world, and then friends must stick together. So our people need the opportunities that this can uh, provide, and I'm very happy and looking forward to the possibility to discuss this with the panel and uh, with all of you. Thank you again for inviting me. All right, well, welcome again um, to this, uh, and I'm pl pleasure to be a part of this very distinguished panel here. Um, obviously, timing is everything, and um, I'll just uh, jump into one of the big, I, I, we'll, we'll be, you know, taking stock of where TTIP is, but um, obviously the big, one of the big questions of the day here, um, Commissioner, um, can TTIP survive Brexit, and how does that happen? Of course it can. That's, <laughs> that's what... It, you, you didn't pay attention. Um, <laughs> of course it can, and it will. Uh, as I said, there are a lot of uncertainties related to, to, to Brexit. Mm -hmm. we, we can't answer them now, and we will have to, to wait until we see a more clearer picture of that. But for now and for, for uh, the immediate future, the United Kingdom is a member of, uh, of the European Union and we negotiate this on behalf of all the 28 members. And yesterday at the European Council, there was a confirmation by all members of, uh, all, all the prime ministers and heads of state that our trade agenda uh, will continue. So I think it makes even more sense to continue with TTIP right now. Sooner or later, we will have to, to take some decisions when we see which way the UK is going, but for the moment, uh, it is there. The US, uh, the US and the EU have all the reasons in the world to facilitate trade uh, between us, and that hasn't changed. So yes, TTIP will survive Brexit. But I guess with the, with the understanding that eventually Britain would be perhaps part of this, perhaps not, hmm. um, how, how do you, I mean, will, will British negotiators, do you expect they'll be in the room? Do you expect, I mean, I know at the council discussions in Brussels already there have been, there's been talk about whether members of the commission and, and negotiators are supposed to be even discussing issues regarding the departure of the UK. Can, can they even talk to each other? So how does that, from, from what you've been planning so far, I mean, how does that work, practically speaking, going forward? Well, it is the commission and the commission team who negotiate this. We have British citizens in our team. They mm -hmm. remain. They do not work for the UK. They work for the European Union, and they will stay. Uh, and that was a clear message by President Juncker the other day. Uh, we, before and after each negotiation round, uh, we, we discuss with representatives of member states, we discuss regularly with the trade ministers to keep them informed and, and to, see the, you know, to seek their support for each of the steps we will be taking. Uh, I, I have no reason to, to believe that the UK will not be in the room when we discuss this. And as I say, when they are members, they have the full uh, competences uh, to, to do that. Uh, they have been very supportive. UK is one of the, the, the strongest voice for free trade, and that is one of the reasons I will be sad to see them leaving. Um, and and I, I guess they, they will. Will they eventually be part of the agreement or not? Well, that remains to be seen. Maybe they can join afterwards, or maybe they, well, it, 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 it is a little bit too early uh, to, to say that, but uh, I don't count on them uh, being, being difficult. Of course, we can talk to our British friends, but, but uh, you refer to that statement by President Juncker, we cannot have 28 different parallel negotiations going on. We have to be patient and, and wait for the formal triggering of Article 50 and of uh, the UK to, to sort of define their 
vision of their relation with the, with the EU before we can start negotiating. But in the meantime, business has to go on as usual. We, we are still uh, 27 who will remain. We still have a huge agenda. Trade is only one of them, but we have a few other challenges on migration, security, economy, and so on. And that has to, 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 to remain. I think it would be detrimental to all the citizens if we now started to have some sort of paralysis and, and not doing anything. Oh, uh, we'll, we'll come to, mm -hmm. back to all this, obviously. Uh, Mr. Trumka, the, um, I, I wanted to ask about, you know, the, as, as the commissioner mentioned, TPP has really been the high level, you know, trade, the, more, the more controversial trade um, negotiation going on right now in the, in the American context. And it's the, the conventional wisdom has been that on TTIP, you're not going to see the same kind of, potentially the same kind of concerns from organized labor. Um, that you've seen on TPP and that the debate might be a little bit less, less contentious on the American side as opposed to the European side where it's very contentious. Um, what's, where, what do you say to that to start off? Before we get into your face off with Donald Trump yesterday. Uh, so, yeah. That was a fun time. Yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, let me compliment uh, the commissioner uh, on the transparency of releasing your proposals after you lay them down on the table. We don't do that in this country. Uh, if any of us get to see the proposals, we have to sign a statement saying we won't divulge it to anybody. So I just thought about something. If they give them to you, do you divulge them to people in Europe, the U.S. proposals? No, we can't do that because we are not legally uh, constrained. What we do is that the so-called consolidated texts that are sort of chapters we have both negotiated, we keep them in the reading room. So national parliamentarians and members of the European Parliament have access to them, but in reading rooms. Oh, so you can't release them? We cannot release a, a foreign country document, no. Why, so, sorry. Why, why is that? You can release yours, but you can't <laughs> release them. Well, we can decide upon our own documents, but we can't decide upon documents that belongs to, to another country. That's part of the problem. Uh, see, they get to debate things over there, and we sort of do all this in secrecy, and the secrecy shrouds these agreements. And you wonder, who's really submitting these rules? Where do they come from? Because I'm going to say this. Every question you ask me, I'm going to say the following words. The question is about whether to trade or not trade. It's about what the rules are and who benefits from the rules. So. Applying that standard to TTIP, there is a much greater uh, likelihood that TTIP could meet the standard and benefit working people. If, in fact, it doesn't, if it can be used, uh, or intentionally or unintentionally, uh, to lower standards, to do away with regulations, to undermine uh, states' and locals' ability uh, to control their own uh, economies, uh, then you will see a backlash here as well, and you will see uh, not only the American labor movement, but uh, the other 70 to 75 percent of the American population that believes these agreements haven't been good for them. You'll see them standing up and speaking out. Okay. Um, well, Laura, did you, in terms of the, the Brexit debate particularly, are you worried at all that the the departure of the EU, uh, sorry, of the UK and the or the in any sense, a reduced influence by the UK on the TTIP negotiations will complicate things. You know, what was already a challenging deal to get done this year will, will make it impossible. A couple of comments to begin with. One, UPS is trade. We operate in 220 countries and territories. We cross borders every day. We are big champions of trade. We're also big believers in high standards. We're a proud union company that believes in ensuring that our people are well paid, um, that safety is at the highest standards, that we protect uh, our people um, in every aspect of the work that we do, because at the end of the day, our success depends on our people. We believe trade agreements are a great way for advancing uh, these high standards as well as creating growth and opportunities. Every 22 packages that cross a border support a job in our network. And the fact is that every free trade agreement that has been negotiated by the US, we've seen a 20% volume increase. Why is that? Because the small and medium-sized companies that ship with UPS are able to access more markets. So from that perspective, we want to see more trade happening everywhere. UPS delivers the goods that are made uh, by the world, for the world, to the rest of the world. And so agreements 
agreements like TPP and agreements like TTIP are so critically important for creating those kinds of economic opportunities and raising those standards. From the perspective of the UK and uh, their decision to la uh, leave the EU, um, UPS's goal is going to be to make sure our customers in the UK and our customers in the rest of the world can continue to trade. Um, there is going to be some practical implications to some of the changes that are going to occur if they do decide to um, exercise uh, their exit um, from the EU. UPS's goal is going to be to make it possible for people to keep doing the business that they're doing because at the end of the day, that trade has allowed the UK to continue to grow, the uh, European market to continue to grow and the US market to continue to grow and so are we worried about what the implications of Brexit are we don't like the uncertainty but we have learned to operate in a lot of uncertain situations and what we fall back on is great service understanding the processes and delivering that to our customers and we're going to continue to do that with the UK in or with the UK out and let me ask you this and this is really a question for all of you obviously we are in a presidential campaign here uh, President Hillary Clinton, President Donald Trump on TTIP. What do you all think? How would it, how would it shake out? <laughs> <laughs> who, wants to, who wants to start? I, I get the question all the time sure. about um, what UPS thinks about a Clinton presidency or a Trump mm -hmm. presidency. And you know what I tell my CEO? It doesn't matter to me who the President of the United States is. My job is to make sure that either candidate, whoever they are, um, understands what's at stake for our employees and the growth of our business. And so from that perspective, our job is um, maybe a little bit more challenging given some of the statements that have been made about trade. It's our job to go in and explain how we do what we do at UPS, what our customers need to be able to grow, some of the challenges that they face at the borders because there's a lot of friction at the borders that really affects small and medium-sized companies that we need to address, and we need to convince both candidates about um, the importance of continuing to engage in a robust trade agenda, because it's at the heart of growth, not just for the US or Europe, but the global economy, period, full stop. I'd say that the actual negotiations would be a lot more pleasant under Hillary than they would under Donald, uh, given his lack of uh, patience uh, with people and his uh, intolerance for disagreements or differing points of view. Uh, I think uh, workers would fare much better uh, under, under Hillary Clinton administration because she cares more, she cares about our values more than he does. Uh, I think uh, the likelihood of him wanting to be, uh, show how macho he really is, the first thing out of the chute, would make getting an agreement more difficult because I'm not so sure it would be about negotiations uh, or as much as it would be about imposing someone's point of view on someone else. Uh, and between long-term friends and trading partners, I don't think that's necessarily a good way to do business. Yeah. Well, obviously, <laughs> as a representative of the European Commission, we have no view of who should be the next president of the United States. Could, could, and my you... personal views might be interesting, but not very relevant in this context. Uh, but uh, but uh, whoever is the, the president of the United States, he or she is one of the most you know, powerful persons in the world. And one would hope that uh, the relationship between the EU and the US, uh, is so important not only in trade, but for so many other reasons, would, would remain so, somehow. Uh, would it be easier or more, more or with one or the other? Maybe. Uh, but we will have to deal with whoever it is. Do you, are you, I mean, obviously the, the, the way, the political context behind kind of the trade politics in the US has changed quite a bit in the last year. Mm. Um, because you have in both parties a strong, you know, you have, uh, concerns about trade, skeptics of trade, really taking the center stage. Um, does that, how has that affected TTIP negotiations thus far? I mean, how, how is the presidential campaign in the background playing out? How is that affecting your job? Well, it's obviously there in, in the background. You have an increasingly anti-trade debate in, in this country, but we have it in Europe as well, and we see it in many other countries. Uh, trade, it's globalization, it's frustration. I mean, we have, we have gone through a, a terrible economic crisis. We're not quite out of it. Many people have really suffered. 
Uh, so, of course, this is in, in, in the background of, of our discussions. I haven't heard, I might have missed it, but I'm really trying to say, I haven't heard neither candidate Trump or, or, or Hillary Clinton mentioning TTIP at all, actually. Uh, so, so um, obviously, TTIP is not really on the radar, so far at least, in the, in the presidential campaign here. So, so what we have said together with uh, Ambassador Froman and his team is that, that we, we continue, of course, political events might, once the campaign becomes in the more intense phase and, and the election day gets closer, it could complicate uh, final concessions that are needed. That is totally normal in, in all uh, countries. But so far, we are moving full steam ahead and, and see what, what, uh, what can be done. I think we owe that to, to our, our, uh, our constituencies uh, who have given us that mandate. To, to achieve the goal, the, the goal of getting a, a deal or an arrangement or whatever it would be called exactly in place, by before President Obama leaves office. What, in terms of a timetable, what has to happen when, when do you have to get that done? It would seem you don't have much time left. I think theoretically it could be close to the 19th of January, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but give, given that you just said that, you know, once the election happens, everything kind of changes. I mean, realistically, do you need to have a deal in place in, before then, or I mean, do you really? No, I, I think, I mean, of course it is totally realistic that, that even if we agree tomorrow that, that an agreement will be voted and ratified and signed and, and stamped, neither here or in, in, in our countries. So what, what we can aim at is to have an agreement that, that, that is there and that we have sort of said, this is it. Uh, and then obviously the next administration will need to, to, to deal with that package. Um, but that work can go on, I think, through at least half of, of, of January, uh, theoretically, if, if there is the political room of maneuver and the political will. So we, we are pushing. We have uh, uh, the next round of negotiation that goes on for a week in July, starting the 11th of July. Uh, we will be meeting with, with, um, with our, our teams on different levels before and, and that time and, and after. Uh, and then we will have um, a meeting with, uh, I will come back here just after the summer as well. So there, there are constant meetings and telephone calls and video conferences to take stock and see, see where we are. The instant that people believe uh, that this agreement could be a reality before the end of this term, it'll get injected into presidential That's politics. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the more that uh, you and Mike Froman go around the country saying, we're gonna have it done before the end of the year, the more likely it is that it will become a presidential issue. You might not like the results uh, of that, uh, but it will become a presidential issue. Uh, the likelihood of it getting through uh, being a reality and getting a vote is zero and none. There's no chance, uh, which would mean it would be put off into the next president's uh, term no matter what it is, and both of those presidents are going to want to put their imprimatur uh, on an agreement. They may want to scrap it if it doesn't meet the needs uh, of working people. One of them may want to scrap it for the sake of showing that uh, he's scrapping it. Uh, and so uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a complicated subject, and you make it more complicated by pretending uh, that there'll be an agreement before the end of the year, because I don't see that any likelihood at all of that happening. If that doesn't happen, if, if, if it goes beyond this year, then you have French elections, German elections, um, does the political landscape become, it seems it becomes even harder to get it done any time in the next few years? Optimism is a duty. Um, <laughs> and and I, I think, I've, of course, there, there are elections, there, there are hurdles, there is the, the rhetoric right now, but when all this has calmed down, I think we all realize that making trade easier between the two biggest economic partners who already trade a lot is a good thing per se. Then, of course, how we do it, that, that is the question. That is why we are negotiating. Uh, and I would imagine that this rational remains um, for, 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 for quite some time. If we don't get it done before the end of the mandate, well, we will have to, to move as much as possible to, to, you know, so it is at a point of, of no return. And then we'll have to see with, with the next administration. There will be elections also in, uh, um, you mentioned Germany and France, in the Netherlands and a few other countries as well. There are always elections in the European Union. We're 28, there's always elections. Um, but we, we, we will have to manage that and we have to see. 
I can also yeah. comment. Yeah. Um, everything that we're talking about isn't being done in a political vacuum. It's mm -hmm. not just the US and the EU. It is a whole rest of the world exactly. that, um, as we are talking about these issues, uh, China, Japan, Korea, ASEAN are um, pursuing the RCEP agreement. Um, maybe it's going to take them a little bit longer, but the rest of the world is continuing to negotiate free trade agreements um, and set certain rules of, uh, of trade that uh, I think some, some of us may not necessarily agree with. There's also 21st century challenges that really need to be grappled with. And at the end of the day, I'd rather have US and European negotiators where we sh share the same values um, addressing those kinds of issues. I'm thinking about cross-border data flows. I'm thinking about how we address a greater partnership to be able to allow trade to flourish but counter some of the cybersecurity threats that are out there. I'd like to see ways to really promote greater innovation um, through protections of biologics that aren't just US and European rules, but ones that allow the ability to bring those kinds of life-saving medicines to anyone and everyone in the world. And yes, UPS will ship them there, but you need the intellectual property right protection so that the um, investment that goes into developing these kinds of medicines is protected, but that the access that people need to those medicines can also be encouraged. Um, and I think that comes through a good, robust dialogue between US and Europe European negotiators, and that's what's at stake in this agreement. In, in a lot of our conversations beforehand, we talked about the fact that TTIP really is about two allies, two friends, two partners coming together, really setting the rules for globalization. We want to have high standard labor agreements. We want to have strong investment protections. We want to have protection for intellectual property. We have a lot of things that we want to ensure become globalized in a very high standard way, and not necessarily Lowing, lowering regulations. I think about where UPS stands on sustainability. We want to have you know, good green standards uh, everywhere in the world. But you do that when you come together and you reach agreement. And that can happen in the TTIP, but not if we abandon all trade. Well, I don't think anybody is suggesting. I know we're not. Because again, the question isn't about whether to trade or not. The question is about what the rules are and who benefit uh, from the rules. Uh, if you look at uh, this situation, it could very well be uh, that you come up with a great agreement. It could also be that you come up with a very bad agreement. Uh, let's set the parameters about what's at stake here. This isn't some panoply of growth for Europe or the United States. Uh, the recent studies say that in 15 years, Europe will achieve 0.5% additional growth if TTIP is signed and the U.S. will get 0.4%. So this isn't some great strategy for growth. Uh, this is, could be political, uh, that we want to have friends make stronger ties with friends. I'm all for that. Uh, but it could be that it also weakens things. Uh, because all the rules that you're setting up that I've seen, none of them have been tools to increase the lower standards. They've all been tools that can be used to decrease the existing standards downward. Uh, and so we're a little skeptical. And we're a little skeptical because we've been promised manna from heaven with every trade agreement that came down. And manna hasn't come from heaven. Uh, we've seen the wrath from the other place uh, in most instances. And so workers are a little bit skeptical about this. And I'll repeat what I said earlier. If ever there was a chance or an agreement for us to get it right, this is the agreement that we can get it right in. And I hope we do. But we're concerned. We're concerned about a special court system being set up uh, in TTIP. Look, we're doing tremendous investment in business back and forth right now. No special court. So what's the need for it? When we ask that, we're told, well, you have to have something. Well, we have a court system. And that court system is good enough for every citizen here. It ought to be good enough for investors. But it, it isn't. So we'll have a special court system that has a very, very loose standard, fair and equitable treatment. So in part of the proposals, you had the, the uh, Retailers Association put in proposals. And you had uh, Walmart put in a proposal that says eliminate local location, geographical locations, make that violate the standard. Now, why did they do that? 
because they wanted to eliminate zoning standards, local zoning standards, and make that so they could use it that if it, they're denied a store, we have to pay them. This is the only system in the world where if someone is killing you, you have to pay them to stop killing you. That's exactly what happens with the system. If they're giving you a product that causes cancer and we stop it, the government has to pay them because they stopped it and hit their bottom line because of this nebulous standard of fair and equitable treatment. If it isn't fair and equitable treatment, I pay you to, do, to stop doing what you're doing. That makes us a bit nervous. And it makes us uh, want to say, let's come up with a better standard. Now, I applaud, I'm sorry, I, I applaud you for some of the, the things that you did uh, on the labor and environmental side, because I think they're helpful. Mm -hmm. I think they help and they better define uh, what they mean and what they don't mean. But the, the ICS or the ISDS is simply a, a point that is unnecessary and nobody's made the case about why it's necessary when we have two court systems that are highly developed, that we have trillions of dollars of investment that have been brought in without it, and now suddenly we need some special court for foreign investors that doesn't apply to any citizen. Commissioner, if, if on, mm -hmm. on that point, um, you're obviously getting, you have a lot of concerns on both sides about, the, about this court setup. Um, from, from the labor side, as was just articulated, from the business side, there's concerns about changing the previous arrangement, as, as, as I believe you've proposed doing in kind of your, your new proposal. Where do things stand on that in the context of the TTIP negotiations right now? Are you any closer, like, how are you managing those two competing, those competing views, and are you any closer to finding a, a solution? Hmm. Yes, first let, let me start by saying that, of course, a TTIP agreement, however successful and ambitious it is, is not the only answer to growth. It is a part of it. But as you are and as we are, we are negotiating around 20 trade agreements right now. So trade is important for growth. It has proven very important for the European Union. But of course, we need to do a lot of other things. So, so it's one piece of our, our growth uh, strategy. And uh, we have very, very... Um, active stakeholders, not only member states, but also different stakeholders who follow our negotiations closely and scrutinize and will follow whatever comes out of it very, very closely as well. There is no way we can conclude an agreement that is not um, setting high standards and, and is, is irreversible in, in making sure that the standards can only be higher, never lower. Um, on the, the, this investment court system, because this ISDS is probably the most toxic um, um, acronym in the European Union has been so for quite some year. What are we talking about? We're talking about foreign investment uh, in another, another country. Foreign investment is by nature a little bit more vulnerable than domestic in investment. And that is why the, the world has since 1959 set up thousands of bilateral investment treaties in order to protect that. Mostly it has worked well. There are some cases where there has been abuses, not that it had gone all the way, but tried to, to, to use it in a way to, to stop countries, democratic elected governments, to, to do, uh, regulate to protect environment or, or, or the citizens. Uh, the European Union has around 1,500 of these uh, investment agreements. I think there are almost 4,000 in the world. And they are in need of modernization. Desperate. This is a discussion that is not only taking place here and in Europe, it's in South Africa, in Indonesia, in Mexico, in Canada, in Malaysia, all over. Um, so we thought that TTIP, because it, we had such a high uh, expectations and, and uh, we, we still have, could be a moment to, to, to reform this. Uh, to recognize that, yes, there could be cases, I think very few between the EU and, and the US actually, and most cases of course can be solved in, in ordinary Courts. But as we also want to, to set standards for, for the world, this could be a way. And US have nine bilateral agreements with Eastern and Central European countries. So this would be a way to abolish them and to replace them with a new, new system. Because they are there, they will not go away. And in our mandate, and in, uh, this is clear that we should seek some so, sort of protection. So what we have proposed is a system that is much more transparent, that limits abuse, uh, that defines when it can be used and, and, and not, and where we have an, uh, an, an appeal system, a sort of 
court with a pool of pre-selected judges instead of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of lawyers uh, in order to, to, to make it more, more transparent and more court-like system. And we envisage that this could be actually something we could work on globally that would replace all this. We have uh, Canada and Vietnam on board for this in our agreements with them. It, it is fully in there. It has been developed in a very close cooperation with our member states, with the European Parliament, and so on. Again, I think there would be very, very few cases with uh, the US because we both have robust legal systems, uh, but it could set the tone also for, for other countries. We are discussing this with the US. The US uh, perfectly agree that we should have more, I mean, transparency is important, that the right to regulate for countries uh, should be covered. They have gone through uh, different um, systems as well, or, or reforms. It is a, a debate uh, to a certain extent in, in the Congress, I, I, I understand. But we haven't find, you know, we haven't concluded that chapter yet. Uh, so we'll see where, where we get. In T, 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 TPP, sorry, there's so many acronyms, they swamp of acronyms. Um, in TPP, there is something similar. So of course, if the European Union would enter into trade agreement with US, where Peruvian, Canadian, Malaysian uh, companies would be better protected than Europe, that, that is a very difficult thing to defend. It, it's sort of a, a circular argument to say they're there so they should stay there. If they're unfair here and they're unfair here, they're unfair. Uh, and that's what this system is. And if you say there'll be very few cases, it's all the more reason not to have a, a special court system for foreign investors that's, that locks out uh, the general public and citizens in every country. Let the courts handle that. It's done well for years and years and years and years since we left uh, England uh, in 1776. It's, I mean, it's been a wonderful experience for us. Yeah. If, if last word before there, we go to there's, questions. There's, yeah. um, there's incredible value in terms of getting it right with respect to investor protections between the US and the EU, because as you rightly point out, the system's been working quite well. But this is hopefully going to be an open platform agreement that is going to result in the adoption of these kinds of high standards by other mm. countries. I think about the bilateral investment treaty negotiations that were that are underway right now with China. We don't have strong investor protections right now in China. And I don't have as much confidence in uh, the Chinese court system as I do in European or American courts. And therefore, I see great value in terms of setting that standard and then bringing the Chinese along. And I can say that right, from very I, personal if experience. If I were dealing with China, mm -hmm. I'd probably want that same system. Uh, but we're not dealing with China yeah. here. This is two, two countries two markets that have dealt with each other for hundreds of years, have highly developed court systems that do not need a special court system for foreign investors. But I would argue that there is strong, robust transatlantic trade, and we make products and services together that we then send to the rest of the world. It is in our interest to have US and European standards be the ones by which the rest of the world then tries to reach up to. Um, and that, I think, protects uh, US and uh, European companies. See, Laura, that's another circular argument, mm -hmm. because we're told we need these systems in place so we can make their court systems come up to speed. You're using it the opposite to say because they're up to speed, we still need them out there so that they don't come up to speed. So you have to make a decision. I, it I either know. helps them develop a court system or it doesn't. And but you that, can't have it both ways. On Maybe that note, yeah. I think I have to cut everybody yeah. off because it's time to let <laughs> our, our friends here have a, a chance at a few questions. Um, Do we have uh, the microphones? Yes. We have microphones on both sides. Um, it will take two questions at a time. And OK. Back there and here. Hi, this is uh, Gary O'Donoghue from. Oh, sorry. Where are you? Gary O'Donoghue from BBC News. Um, Commissioner, can I ask you, what kind of access do you think the UK can get to the single market if it doesn't agree to, f <laughs> if it doesn't agree to freedom of movement? Well, well, I can't answer that. The uh, access to the freedom of market, with that comes also freedom of movement. There are four freedoms in the European Union. They are interlinked and they go together. So. Um, hi, thank you. Uh, Jim Berger from Washington Trade Daily Publication. Just a simple question over the last two years, I've heard a lot of 
talk about uh, TTIP. Uh, what I haven't heard, I heard a lot about political will, and which you mentioned, hey, we need it. Uh, does political will include a willingness for both sides to make some serious compromises? Because I haven't heard the word compromise much in two years. I think I said concessions. But uh, <laughs> may maybe it's my, my um, I'm not a native English speaker. Uh, maybe, um, th 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 no, I didn't use that, that word. But obviously, I mean, if we were not ready to compromise, why would we engage in, in negotiations? Of course, we all need to, to, uh, to compromise. We need to see what, what's on the table. What, what, what are your priorities? Are they enough uh, so that you can compromise on those? And that's what makes it complicated. But yes, that's why we, we, we engage on this. We need to compromise. The whole European Union is about compromising, actually. So we're quite good at compromising. Yeah. Up here and then all the way in the back. Hi, my name is... Silence. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, my name is Adam Siegel. I'm a reporter with MLEX. Um, I'm curious, at what point sure. during uh, Article 50 enactment, if it gets used uh, by the UK to pull out would that change uh, the priorities for your office in negotiating the TTIP? Is that at the beginning? Is that towards the end? Is it after formally leaving? Is it uh, during the process? When, when does that begin to alter how the commission sees its priorities? Thanks. Well, first of all, the, the British governments have to, to evoke or trigger Article 50. Uh, we don't, that can, obviously will not happen before uh, September, at least. The, um, uh, the president of the European Council, um, uh, Donald Tusk, called for an extraordinary meeting in, in September to, to discuss and to take stock where, where we are. I think it depends very much. So this is the, the sort of formal exit discussions that would take place. How do you leave? At what pace do your, your members of the European Parliament, uh, other, the, the budget, the, the access to, to the different funds? I mean, all these technical things that need to be negotiated with, with the UK. That is what Article 50 is about. Then comes what kind of relationship shall we have with the UK? Do they want a sort of a total independence relationship, seeking a free trade agreement with us and nothing else? Do they want a Norwegian solution? Do they want a Swiss solution? I mean, we don't know. That is up to them to define this is our objective, and then it has to be discussed with, uh, with member states. So, so very much will depend uh, on that. Uh, once they exit the European Union, of course, they need to exit all our, our trade agreements as well, uh, and they need to renegotiate if, if they think that that, that is appropriate. Uh, the old ones that we have, around 37, uh, plus WTO. And then all the, the other ongoing uh, trade agreements, we will have to see case by case what to do uh, with, with, uh, with the UK part of it. So, so that, that will be quite, quite a heavy exercise. But it cannot start before we know uh, what kind of, of relationship uh, they want to have. But they do not. Um, I think whatever solution the UK uh, chooses, they will, cannot sort of automatically be in our, our trade agreement still. They have to go, go out. Norway is not part of, of, of our trade agreement, for instance, even if they are part of the, the internal market. So that, that is an exercise that we'll have to, to, to start once we have more clarity. Yeah, it's complicated, yeah. All the way in the back. Uh, thank you. Uh, Will Malden with the Wall Street Journal. I'm uh, just wondering, uh, Ms. Malmstrom, uh, if you, uh, how will you set the priorities for trade negotiations and other negotiations? You know, you'll have the EU exiting the European, sorry, the uh, UK exiting the European Union, perhaps. Uh, the UK doesn't have its own trade negotiators now. It might recall some from the EU, I guess. Then you'll also need to be working on the TTIP deal with the US. Will you divide your negotiating teams? Will you add more? I mean, some of the UK voters seem to think they're, they're limitless civil servants in, in Brussels, but probably you have to make priorities, and it would be interesting to know what that might be. Uh, Mr. Trumpka, and also, if, if you could uh, say whether you'd support a no-frills trade talks with the UK, as uh, some of the Republican leaders have. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for the concern about our staff in DigiTrade. They are, are, are already very much uh, overstretched because TTIP, uh, we're discussing that today, but as I said, we, we are negotiating around 20 agreements. We have just finished with, with Vietnam and Canada. We're negotiating with the Philippines, with Mexico, with the Tunisia. 
Uh, we are preparing with Mercosur, with, with Chile, with uh, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand, and I've probably forgotten a few. So, so we, we have already a quite heavy agenda. And what, where exact in that line we would put the UK, uh, I'm not in a position to tell you today. And, but we'll, we'll, of course, reflect uh, upon that. I don't want that headline in BBC or Wall Street Journal tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know what a no-frill trades agreement is. Uh, if somebody might define that for me, I might be better off. Look, uh, England, whether they are in the EU or not in the EU, are great friends and great allies. Uh, and we're going to remain close, mm. and we're going to continue to do trade and do business with them. Uh, and so. I don't know have anything to say uh, beyond that. They are friends, they are allies, and we will treat them as friends and allies. Yeah. A few questions over here. Make there first. Hi, Brett Fortnum from Inside US Trade. Um, first, specific to only the TTIP negotiations, um, are you on, I, I know you mentioned that you're, you're still on, on track and can still conclude them in 2016, um, but in terms of when the end game phase would start, um, my understanding is there's a stock taking of trade ministers in September. You have, I, I can't hear you, you have uh, to speak sorry. closely, sorry. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned uh, you're still on, on on track to potentially conclude in 2016. Um, now, my understanding is there's a stock taking of trade ministers in September um, that could determine whether or not you'd enter into the end game. Um, and, and you've mentioned your priorities there. Are those priorities being addressed, and do you expect um, those to move forward at this upcoming round in July? Um, uh, I mean, is the U.S. moving on their positions uh, on things such as public procurement and services? Um, and could also, uh, could you also just clarify one aspect of Article 50 for me? Um, you mentioned the trade relationship with um, the, the U.K. being negotiated. Would that happen after the Article 50 negotiations or as part of it? First on that, the Article 50 has never been used. So there is, uh, uh, you know, there, there are lots of, of question marks uh, exactly on, on what, what it goes. This is, I mean, there, I think there are different views on, on this, and, but, but that's why we need some time to reflect. The referendum was only on, 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 uh, on I mean, the, the result was only known on Friday. Today it's Wednesday. Uh, we, we need some time to, to, to think uh, and to reflect, and that's ultimately a decision by heads of states of the other 27. To see, can these go in parallel, or do we have to do a, a few things b before? So, so I don't know is the honest answer. For the rest, yes, absolutely. We will have a, a trade ministerial meeting in, in September. We meet with the trade ministers regularly, so it's, it's one of the informal ones in the new presidency of Slovakia. Uh, where we will take stock, and I will g tell them then, you know, give the evaluation of the, the July round and of the talks we've had over the summer on all the issues that, that you mentioned and I mentioned in my speech as well. These are priorities for us. Member states will accept, will, will expect that there is, a, you know, a sufficient um, way forward already agreed and, and uh, a path towards the end uh, as well. And this is what we will discuss. And uh, but that is in, in end of September, and we still have some work to do before that. I think we have one last question up here. Hi, thank you. Nelson Cunningham with Bacardi Associates, also a board member of the Atlantic Council. Uh, you mentioned that the TTIP talks could be considered a, a, an open platform for others to add. Well, today, President Obama is in Ottawa meeting with uh, Prime yeah, Minister Trudeau English. and, and uh, with the Mexican president for a North American summit. Uh, there was some talk of whether or not the NAFTA countries might join with the U.S. in TTIP talks. What would be your view, looking down at the future, to have Canada and the U.S. join, uh, Canada and Mexico join the TTIP discussions? And Mr. Trumka, what would your position be on that? Uh, anything that gives us a chance to redo NAFTA uh, would be a great <laughs> opportunity from our point of view. <laughs> I don't comment on that particular aspect, uh, but we have said all the time from the European Union that, that, that it is a good idea to make TTIP an open platform. First of, course, first of course, we have to conclude it. But after that, we think it's a good idea if others could join. When we, ha we haven't you know, started negotiations on this because we have to conclude, but when we talked about it, we were imagining maybe Mexico and Canada, and from our side, 
there has been some interest or at least some, some uh, discussions in countries like Norway or, or Turkey, then maybe the UK could be one, one of these uh, as well, depending. So, so I think it's a good idea to have an open platform and we would welcome you know, the, these countries and, and possibly others as well. And with that, I think we have to wrap things up. Uh, thank you so much again, everyone. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, everyone else on our panel here. Uh, thank you. 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 Thank you.